God, you are good. You are my daddy. You're I'm in charge. charge. Your, Your kingdom, kingdom come. come. I need help. Heal Please. me. Encourage, Encourage me. Lead me. Pardon me. me. So do they. Those I love. Those, those I, I don't. don't. This hurting world. Thank you. Welcome to Your Best 10 Minutes, a series of messages on prayer designed for those who struggle to pray. The idea is simple. All the prayers in the Bible can be summarized in a brief one. And as we work our way through this prayer several times a day, it not only lifts our spirits, it provides a table of contents, it takes us into things for which to pray that perhaps we had forgotten to pray for. The prayer is simple. Say it with me. God, you are good. I need help. So do they thank you. We declare the goodness of God. Everything hinges upon and begins with the goodness of God. And because he is good, we can ask him for help. We can say, Lord, heal me and encourage me and lead me and pardon me, help me. And we know people who need help. We have people we love who need help. And people we don't love who need help. This hurting world needs God's help. And thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And so we learn to pray and to stand in God's presence. Most powerful and greatest invitation that we have is to pray on behalf of others. You've been there sitting perhaps in the emergency room, surrounded by neighbors whose son was in a car accident. They're concerned. The situation is desperate. You wonder, is there anything you can do? You've been there, you received a phone call from a friend, <clears throat> a co-worker, she was laid off. The economy finally caught up with her business. 55 years old, in a struggling economy. You wonder, what can you do? You've been there. You've been there. You've tried to speak some sense into your own child. But now she's 18 years old. Last thing she wants is advice from her parents. But as sure as the sun's coming up tomorrow, you can see she is on the wrong road. And you're out of solutions. And you wonder, what can you do? What do you do when someone you love is sick? When someone you love is in trouble? When someone you love is in a desperate situation? What do you do? Well, I've got an interesting suggestion. And that is, make the midnight knock. This is Jesus' idea, and it comes out of one of the most interesting parables that he left us to teach us the power of intercessory prayer. It's found in the book of Luke. I'm going to read it to you. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight, wanting to borrow three loaves of bread, and you say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, and I have nothing for him to eat. And... Suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me. The door is locked for the night and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. Isn't that a funny story? And so I tell you, keep on asking. And you will receive what you ask for. Keep on knocking. And the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. <laughs> so that's you. Ringing the doorbell... At midnight, the neighborhood is quiet, the streets are still, the sky is dark, and so is the two-story house of your friend. But still, there you are in the middle of the night at his front door, ringing his doorbell, not once, not twice, but three times, ding dong. Ding dong. 
Sounds so loud in the middle of the night. Ding dong. It's a big house that's got a big chime. From within, you can hear his little chihuahua dog, Snoopy. <clears throat> He's got this, who do you think you are, bark. And you can imagine what's starting to happen upstairs. His wife is kicking him under the covers. Hank, Hank, get up, get up. He's sound asleep. She kicks him, get up, get up. Somebody's at the door. Poor Hank, sound asleep one minute. Then his wife kicks him. Doorbell's ringing, dogs barking. He's not going to like this. You notice that the light on the porch upstairs, upstairs porch gets flipped on. You hear the door open to the upstairs porch. You step back and you look up and there's Hank looking down at you. Boy, does he look like a mess. Whiskers on his face, pillow creases, boxer shorts, t-shirt. He looks down at you and he says, Tom, is that you? Yeah. Do you know what time it is? Yeah. What do you want? Jesus tells you what you're supposed to say at this point. You're supposed to say, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit and I have nothing for him to eat. Hank grumbles and complains, get out of here, Tom, go home. I'm going back to bed. But you insist. You stand there. You even ring the doorbell another time or two. The dog barks. He can hear his wife complaining. Finally, he says, all right, all right, because of your shameless persistence. Meet me downstairs in the pantry. And so you go in, he goes to the pantry, he opens the pantry, you fill up a basket of food and you take it home and your unexpected guest has food to eat. Why? Because you spoke up on his behalf. Now this curious story is in the Bible to help us understand the power of persistent intercessory prayer. When we come before someone who can on behalf of someone who cannot. When we come before someone who has on behalf of someone who has not. When we come before someone who is capable on behalf of someone who is incapable. This is intercessory prayer at its purest. It is really a combination of our paucity and our audacity. Our paucity in that we're saying, we don't have anything, but we know your pantry is full. We can't fix the boy in the surgery, but we know you can, God. Please help. We can't create a new job for our friend, but we know you can, God, so please help. We can't, we can't wake up our teenager, but we know you can, God, and so we have come to you to ask for help. And this prayer, according to Jesus, gets God's attention. As we keep asking, as we keep seeking, as we keep knocking, as we refuse to give up, as we are persistent, this gets God's attention. If Hank, who is, was sound asleep and who tends to be moody and cranky, if even Hank would give food, how much more would God who never sleeps, and who's never moody, and who's never cranky, who is a good God, how much more would He give us more than enough to help those who are in need? This is the point of this parable. The invitation is, do you know someone who needs help? Then you be the one who makes the midnight knock. You be the one who offers the prayer. Or if you prefer, de-roof the house. You know this story. It's the story that took place in the days of Jesus in the town of Capernaum. Jesus was in a small fishing village of Capernaum near the Sea of Galilee. 
He was teaching in a house. And the house was packed with people. They were sitting in the windowsill. They were standing in the doorway. The place was floor, door to door, wall to wall, floor to ceiling with people. There were four friends of a paralytic who wanted to present their paralytic friend to Jesus. He didn't have any hope outside of Jesus. His body was rendered immobile from whatever reason, maybe a disease or an accident. But he couldn't walk, he couldn't feed himself, he couldn't care for himself. And all he had going for him were these four friends. And all they had going for them was this hunch that if they could get their friend into Jesus' presence, that something would change. <clears throat> so they showed up, but the house was packed. And they couldn't get in anywhere. It was too crowded. So they set their friend down in the front lawn. They got around him, made a circle, and said, what are we going to do? They began thinking of their options. One of them said, well, let's just yell fire. Another one said, I know, let's just barge in and knock everyone over. But a third one said, hey, I've got an idea. He said, I know this type of roof. I know this kind of house. I used to be in the roofing business. I know what we can do. The next thing you know, these four friends have carried their friend on his mat up on the roof. And they're down there pulling the shingles out. They're de-roofing the house. They're creating a hole. Well, by now, the whole teaching session has been interrupted. And this is a risky move. De-roofing is antisocial. <laughs> little by little, a hole begins to appear. Big enough, finally, for the man on the mat to be lowered down. And so they come up with these four ropes. Each one ties an end to the corner of the mat they promise their buddy they won't drop him and they start inching him down everybody down there is looking up there and at some point the four guys up there are looking back down below it's a curious scene and as they look down they see the face of Jesus looking up at them and I'm wondering what was the expression on the face of Jesus was he angry was he frustrated? After all, his message had been interrupted. Well, according to Scripture, we have every reason to believe he was smiling. Because here's what Jesus did. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. He went straight to the core issue, and that is the deepest need of any human is the forgiveness of sin. He followed that up with healing, physical healing. But what strikes me about the paragraph is that Jesus was struck not with the faith of the paralytic, but with the faith of the friends. Did you see that? When Jesus saw their faith, their faith. No reference is made to the faith of the needy person. Maybe he, had an amount, maybe he had an abundance of faith. Maybe he had no faith. That's not what moved Jesus. What moved Jesus was the faith of the friends. The man who needed help was given help, not because of his, his faith, but because he had four friends who had faith. Same is true in the parable of the midnight knock. There's no reference made to the person who showed up in the middle of the night needing food, whether he or she had faith or not. The decisive person in the story is the one who had enough faith, persistent faith, to come and knock at the door in the middle of the night. The faith of that person prompted the one who had the full pantry to help the one who had nothing. A few weeks ago, we studied the story of the centurion who was a man of authority in the Roman army. He had a servant who was sick. 
He came to Jesus and asked Jesus to heal his servant. Jesus began walking in the direction of the centurion's house, but the centurion stopped him and said, you don't even have to come to my house. If you just speak the word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus was so impressed with the man's faith that he spoke the word, and in that instant, the man's servant was healed. No reference at all is made to the faith of the servant. Jesus was impressed with the faith of the one who came on behalf of the servant. There are cases in which Jesus will bless someone because of the faith of that someone's friends. There are cases in which Jesus will honor a person even if that person does not offer prayer because that person happens to have people who will pray for them. Well, that'll bring some hope to a parent whose child has gone wayward. That'll bring some hope to a friend whose friend is in the hospital. That'll bring some hope to a person who's concerned for someone who's lost their job because could be they don't have any faith. Could be they're so tired they're out of faith. Could be they're so discouraged they don't even pray anymore. But they are not without faith and hope as long as they have a friend who will pray for them. Now, we do not diminish the importance of the needy person's prayer when it comes to salvation. That prayer must be offered by the individual. Salvation is never given by proxy. An individual must, in them, their own heart, invite Jesus and ask Jesus for salvation. But there are cases, according to these stories, where other types of prayers can be answered. Prayers for financial blessing, prayers for physical healing, prayers for wisdom, prayers for renewal, prayers for second chances. And perhaps the one who needed it the most didn't even offer the prayer. But those around him or her did. The power of intercessory prayer. That's all Jesus responded to was the faith of the friends. And my encouragement to you today is to make the midnight knock on behalf of your friends. My encouragement to you today is to de-roof the house on behalf of your friends. You be the one who brings family and friends and co-workers and even our nation, our city. You be the one who just keeps knocking at the door, keeps knocking at the door. Lord, I've got one more person I need to talk to you about. Lord, I've got one more person I need to talk to you about. Lord, I've got one more person I need to talk to you about. God will not respond as the man did. This is a prayer, a parable of contrast, not comparison. The point is, is that he would eventually help. How much more will God, who is willing to help, who is willing to help? You see, God has enlisted you. He has invited you and he has invited me to come before him on behalf of people who need help. Like last week, we talked about Abraham standing before God on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah, and God changed his plans. Like Moses, who stood before God on behalf of the Israelites, and God changed his plans. You come before God on behalf of your school, on behalf of your country, on behalf of your job, on behalf of your family. You be the one who makes it his or her aim to just knock on the door, knock on the door, knock on the door. After all, when you come to God, you don't come as an outsider or an interloper. You are God's child. You are God's ambassador. You come as a priest. You come as a priestess. When he saved you, he deputized you. And this time on earth is our on-the-job training to learn his heart so that when we reign with him forever, we will know his heart. So he has included you and me as co-workers with him in the efforts to bring people back into a sense of wholeness. Will you do this? I want to give you a very specific challenge. I want to encourage you to think about the five families or five neighbors who live closest to you. Would you make them your prayer mission field? Just pray for them every day, several times a day. As you leave your house, just think about these people down the street or these people in your dormitory, your trailer park, wherever you live. You find the five neighbors who live closest to you. 
We believe that God placed you there sovereignly. That it's by God's sovereign choice that he placed you there so you could pray for them. And I want to encourage you not just to pray for them, but for you to let them know you're praying for them. And ask them, how can I pray for you? Now, you may feel uncomfortable or awkward doing that. If so, you just tell them, my preacher's making me do this. <laughs> he told me I couldn't come back to church. <laughs> just ask them. Most people love the idea of somebody praying for them because maybe they don't pray. And even the most hard-hearted cynic is happy to hedge his bets. All right, go ahead and pray. Now, just, you don't need to be weird about this. You don't need to say, I am here to pray for you. <laughs> you know, don't, don't, you just be normal. Just say, you know, in our church, we're trying to pray for all our neighbors. How can I pray for you? My hunch is they're going to be so happy to know that somebody is praying for them. And my hunch is their life is going to be better because they had friends and their friends had faith and God heard the prayers of their friends and he blessed them because of your faith. Wouldn't that be something? There's not a case in the New Testament of Jesus turning away in intercessory prayer. When Peter brought his mother-in-law, Jesus responded. When Jairus brought his daughter, Jesus responded. When the Canaanite woman brought her daughter, Jesus responded. Every time somebody brought someone to Jesus, Jesus responded. It's like he loves. He loves it when we partner with him and bring these hurting people to him. There are cases in which Jesus spent all day just healing people. Cases in which the disciples were trying to turn people away. And Jesus said, no, let them come. Let them come. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, and the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they laid them at his feet, and he healed them. He never grew impatient with the requests. But there was one occasion that he did grow impatient. And that was a case in which no request was made. Here's the, here's the big point. Bring people to Jesus. And you would have thought the disciples would have got this, but there was a case in which they tried to help somebody without bringing the person to Jesus. A man brought his son to the disciples. The son was an epileptic. The disciples tried to help the son without consulting or asking Jesus for help. And they failed. They could not help the son. When Jesus heard about their failure... He really erupted in what is atypical fashion. He said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Now, Jesus is so uber patient that any sign of impatience is disconcerting. What was it that caused Jesus to erupt like this? Well, simple. They never brought the boy to Jesus. They tried to help the boy without bringing the boy to Jesus. They tried to fix the situation without involving Christ. Later on, they asked Jesus for an explanation. Je the disciples came to Jesus privately and they asked, Why could we not cast it out? Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. In Jesus' lexicon, unbelief is when we try to help somebody without involving him. Isn't that interesting? Unbelief is when we think we can help somebody without taking them to Christ. Belief, then, is making the midnight knock. Belief, then, is deroofing the house. Belief, then, is bringing our friends, our family to Jesus, acknowledging our paucity. We can't help him. Coming with audacity, but you have to help him. And declaring the abundance of Christ to do so. Remember, we don't come to Christ just based on who we are or what we have done. We come to heaven with our prayers in the name of Christ. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. We do not pray in our names. That is to say, we do not pray based on our good name based on our accomplishment 
or in our authority. But we come in the name, that is to say, in the accomplishment or on the good name of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? If I were to walk up to a car dealer and say, I want a brand new car for no price. I want to take it home free. Well, he'll show me the exit. He will not honor that request. If I go to a car dealer and I say, I have a letter here from the owner of the car dealer, and I give him the letter, and it says, give Max Locato any car he wants at no price, signed Red McCombs. <laughs> Guess who goes home in a brand new car? What makes the difference? The name. The name. When we pray, sometimes we, without thinking, tag on the phrase, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It's more than just a phrase that we tag on to a prayer. It's a declaration of authority. That when we pray, the reason prayers have power is because we're appealing to the one who is in charge. To the one who has ultimate authority. And we are there in his name. We are his children. We are his ambassadors. We are part of his priesthood. And so he has called upon us to exercise this authority or work and operate in the name of Jesus Christ. Now this really ticks the devil off because the devil knows that the devil was defeated on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he once and for all disarmed all of the authority of the devil. And Jesus could then say, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So if Jesus has all authority in the universe, that means the devil has no authority except what Jesus permits. So when we pray in the name of Jesus, the devil turns and he tucks his little pointed tail between his legs and he scampers away. Because he knows that he no longer has any authority. And even the problems that are being prayed for have now been lifted up and placed beneath the authority of Jesus. Because we're operating in the authority of Jesus. And so what's happening now is a dialogue between God and saint and the devil is excluded. That's the reason prayer has power. Because we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. We have legal access to the throne room because we are there in the name of Jesus Christ. A few years ago, my wife and I celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. We just happened to be overseas when the 25th wedding anniversary uh, came about. We were in China. Part of our trip to China included a luncheon at the United States Embassy. During conversation with the ambassador, I just happened to mention in casual conversation, well, we're also going to have our 25th anniversary while we're here. Any recommendations on a restaurant? We're going to be in Hong Kong on our 25th wedding anniversary. I didn't know any restaurants in Hong Kong. I said, do you know anything? He said, I know the perfect place. He said, there is a restaurant on the 12th floor of a building. It's exclusive members only restaurant. And I said, well, that's great. I can't go. If it's members only, I'm not a member and I'm not about to join. <laughs> For one meal, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. He said, oh, well, I can take care of that. He called for his aide. His aide came over and he leaned over to his aide and he said to his aide, <laughs> his aide turned to him and said in response, <laughs> and so the ambassador then replied, <laughs> the aide disappeared came back maybe four or five minutes later holding a letter handed it to the ambassador the ambassador took out his pen and he signed it and he handed it to me he said we've made you a reservation at the restaurant you go to the restaurant how would he say that? in my in my name I had a letter from the ambassador that granted me access to what would have been otherwise an inaccessible place. I had access because I was there in the name of the ambassador. And so when I went into the restaurant, I gave the letter to the maitre d'. Quite honestly, I don't think he even asked my name. But he looked at the letter and said, oh, we've been expecting you. And so we had a nice dinner in a place where I otherwise could have had no access. When you pray in the name of Jesus Christ, in his authority, you are presenting a letter to the 
heavenlies to the throne room. You're presenting a letter. And maybe you don't have access to the city council. Maybe you don't have access to the PTA. But listen, as a child of God, you have access to the King of Kings. In the name, by the authority of Jesus Christ. And my prayer, my message to you today is exercise that. Exercise that. You are the salt and light in your neighborhood. You are the salt and light for your family. You are the ambassador for our city, for our nation. We can pray. Make the midnight knock. De-roof the house. And even if they don't have faith, you do. And God will hear and respond to your faith. And if you run out of things to pray and say, just say, God, you're good. I need help. So do they. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We bless you that you would allow us this privilege of prayer. And we declare in the name of Christ that we want to engage with you in prayer. And Lord, we recommit ourselves to being people who pray for people we know. May our church, this your church, be a church that prays, that stands before you with tenacity on behalf of those who need help. Through Jesus we pray. And all the church said, Amen, Amen. amen.